We'll begin reading here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 at verse 1. We'll read to verse 4. We'll get into our study. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your love grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. And so we're beginning a study now in 2 Thessalonians. We'll be looking at the first four verses as we go through 2 Thessalonians. Thessalonians verse by verse. So as is my normal way of beginning things, let me give to you a somewhat prolonged introduction, a background, a reminder, if you will, and then we'll look at the verses in front of us. And so as a, a way of providing uh, the reminder, the background, the second letter is believed to have been written a, a few months after he had written 1 Thessalonians. So the date of this, if you're one who takes dates and all and puts them down, the date of this particular letter is somewhere around A.D. 51. It's possible that the bearer of the first letter returned with an update, and that would prompt the Apostle Paul to write this second letter. So as we saw in 1 Thessalonians, the, uh, the church there in Thessalonica was undergoing affliction and persecution. From the beginning, the church there was birthed in uh, affliction, and from the beginning, they experienced persecution. And so, when Paul was writing to them in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, in verse 5, he had said to them, Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And so, he had begun his letter by reminding them that the gospel had come to them in power, the spirit, and assurance. In other words, the, the gospel came to them in power. That was evidenced by miracles as well as the transformation of their lives. He said the gospel has come to you in the work of the spirit because it's the Holy Spirit who brought conviction of their need for Jesus. And then he, he said it also came in much assurance because you have placed your trust in the gospel and you have also trusted us as its messengers. And so when they became Christians because of the work of the Holy Spirit and the power and all that was evidenced, the result was that the Thessalonians were afflicted. This had caused Paul to become concerned about them. And, and as we went through 1 Thessalonians, he addressed that in the first letter, intending to encourage them in their faith. You see, both Paul and Jesus himself had been persecuted, and they were to use Paul and Jesus as their models. He said in 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 and 7, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. So persecution had arisen against them from their fellow citizens. He had said in 1 Thessalonians 2.14, for you brethren became Im imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea and Christ Jesus. You also suffered the same things from your own countrymen just as they did from the Jews. So the persecution was continuing, and Paul wrote a second letter to encourage them. Now, he had already revealed his concern that they would be discouraged. He had said in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, no one should be shaken by these afflictions. You yourselves know that we are appointed to this. And so they were undergoing persecution and affliction. And so he says, don't be shaken by this, and don't be surprised by it. You're going through persecution, but you should be prepared. You know that I've been persecuted, and you know the Lord Jesus himself has been, and therefore stay strong in Christ. But not only are they undergoing persecution, something more dangerous is taking place. False teaching has begun to infiltrate the church, and the false teachers are influencing the members of the church. And false teaching is especially dangerous. Now, why would false teaching be more dangerous to the church than persecution? Somebody would think that. They'd say, now, wait a minute. If, 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 if I can suffer violent harm, if I lose my job, if my neighbors turn against me, you know, that's, that's, that's difficult. That's hard. Why would you say that false teaching 
is more dangerous. Now, the obvious reason is persecution has a way of purifying the church. Persecution actually has a way of strengthening the beliefs of the body of Christ because persecution actually refines and tests our faith as well as strengthening it. In Romans 5, in verses 3 and 4, Paul said, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they're good for us. They help us to learn to endure. And endurance develops strength of character in us. And character strengthens our confident expectation of salvation. It has a positive work in us when we go through tough times. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, James said, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And so persecution, affliction, the various trials and all that we go through have a way of strengthening us. And a, a genuine Christian follows Christ through an entire lifetime, even though experiencing affliction. In Hebrews 3.14, it says, we have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly to the end the confidence we had at first. And so afflictions, persecutions, and things of that nature have a tendency of refining us. They have a tendency of causing us to cast our cares on Christ and to be strengthened. It has a way of purifying our lives. But on the other hand, false teaching is dangerous. It undermines the hope we have in the promises of God that are revealed in Scripture because bad teaching will infect a church and it will bring the church into bondage spiritually. In the Old Testament, in Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 22, God said, with lies, you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. You have strengthened the hands of the wicked so that he does not turn from his wicked way to save his life. He's speaking to false teachers. He said, you're making the righteous sad. You're strengthening the evil ones in their evil. In other words, you're giving the wicked false confidence. So the worst thing is false teaching causes people to reject the Lord. The result as they enter into judgment. In John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. False teaching is terrible. It destroys. And believers who are influenced by bad teaching or are giving it receive less reward in God's kingdom. That's why in 2 John verse 8, it says, look to yourselves that we may not lose those things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. So a verse-by-verse study of the Word of God combats false teaching. Acts 20, 27, Paul said it like that. He said, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So in their case, false teaching was related to the return of Jesus Christ. The return of Christ to planet Earth is referred many times to in Scripture it's, it's mentioned no less than 318 times in the New Testament. And the return of Christ is the major theme of chapters 1 and 2 of Thessalonians. You see, bad teaching concerning his return has infected the church. It's discouraging them. Some were saying that the day had already come and gone. And that caused great distress amongst the believers in the fellowship. So Paul takes time to give details concerning the conditions that will be present at that time. And we'll look at that in detail when we arrive to that portion of Scripture. So there's your introduction. Let's move into the study, beginning at verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. That's the same introduction we find in 1 Thessalonians we note that Paul didn't need to use his title. They knew him well. Silvanus is also known by the name Silas. He was an elder as well as a prophet, according to Acts 15, verse 32. And Timothy was Paul's son in the faith and was also well known to the church. And so he introduces Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. And then he says who he's writing to, to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it says, to the church of the Thessalonians, and once again, I'll mention this, the Thessalonians were Gentiles. They were Gentiles. They were not Jewish. They were Gentiles. And so Paul is making it very clear that these, though they're not Jews, are still believers. There's no separation between the two. The church is not to be broken into groups and subgroups. We need to remember that in these days especially, we have a tendency of breaking the church into groups and subgroups. 
And so we'll have a group of people that go to a particular church, and, and uh, they may be heavily Hispanic there, and then there'll be another church that's heavily African-American, another one that's heavily Asian, and then churches that are, are heavily, heavily white or whatever. And what happens is we, we begin to have division in the church based on the color of our skin or our ethnic heritage. And every time I come to passages like this, forgive me, you've heard it before, but I'm going to say it over and over again. There's only one body. It's the body of Christ. There's only one color, and it's the color of the blood of Jesus Christ. We all belong to one another, and we have to remember that. It's something I'm telling you. The world sees it very clearly. The world is always marching for some form of unity, this and that. When the church divides into groups and subgroups, we can't have that. Listen, when you get to heaven, they're not going to have a section over here for Mexicans, okay? They're not. And we're not going to be handed lawnmowers and dish towels, okay? You can mow the lawns. No, cut it out. It's not going to happen that way. We're together. We're one in Christ. We belong together. We are family in Christ, and that's what matters. And that's really a biblical message that needs to be repeated today. We have to be careful that we don't choose churches that we attend based on the color of the people or the language that's spoken. We need to go because Jesus Christ is there. He is lifted up, and we are drawn closer to him. And we have people there who love him who can encourage us to do the same. And so the church is not to be broken into groups or subgroups. It is the one body, and it's the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I've mentioned this before. I'll say it briefly. Grace always precedes peace. Always. You will never have peace without God's grace. And in the writings of Paul, you will not see him ever say peace to you and grace. It, uh, it is always grace to you and peace. In the uh, society that uh, existed, the Greek society as well as the Jewish society, they had ways of, of uh, greeting one another. If I were a Greek and I was walking through the city and I ran across a Greek friend, my greeting to him, the typical greeting, would be the word charis. So I'd see him and I'd say charis, that means grace. That was the greeting. But as a Jew, if I were walking through a city and I saw a fellow Jew, I would say shalom. The Jews to this day, you can go anywhere where there's a population of Jews, and if a Jew greets another Jew, they normally will say shalom. You'll see it in Jerusalem. You see it all through Israel. And there are places here in California that I've been at, Dallas or whatever, I've been in New York or in certain places in, in, in L.A. that have a heavy Jewish population, and they'll st they still do it. It's their greeting. It's their customary greeting. Grace to the Greek, shalom from the Jew. So grace to you and peace was the common greeting in Paul's day. Now grace, when we look at grace, grace is a free favor of God that's revealed in the death of Christ and his gift of life to us. In Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So the Greek would say grace, but the Jews would say shalom, peace. And peace is the condition that results from receiving the grace of God. Peace is the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Jesus Christ. Isaiah 26 verse 3 says it like this, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. And so God's grace provides me with God's peace. And so the peace Paul speaks of is from God, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice this again in verse 2, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we're not automatically children of God. I grew up in the hippie generation, and so we as hippies would say, that's a child of God. There was a, a, a song called Woodstock by... Uh, Joni Mitchell wrote it, but Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young sang it. Woodstock, it was the anthem of my generation. Uh, I, I came across a child of God. He was walking along the road, and he said, tell me where you're going, this Etopi, right? Some of you are old enough to remember that. Others, you're going to have to Google that. <laughs> I came across a child of God. And that's the way we spoke of one another. That we were, hey, brother, we're sister. Yeah, that's the way we spoke. It was a common thing. 
So we'd call each other brother. We'd call each other brothers and sisters and all of that. That was, you know, so we thought, oh, yeah, you know, we're all descended from, uh, from Adam and Eve, and, and we're all related one way or another and all. But to be a child of God isn't speaking of God's creation of mankind. To be a child of God speaks concerning the relationship that you have with God through the born-again experience. And it's something you become. It's not something you automatically are. In the book of, uh, of, of uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, speaking of Jesus, it says, uh, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So it's not an automatic at all. So when he's speaking here and saying, peace from God our Father, he's speaking to a church. He's speaking to people who have a relationship with God. So he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father, but he also speaks of Jesus in this way, and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. The word Lord in the Greek is kurios. Kurios, it speaks of the owner. It speaks of one who has control over a person. It speaks of a master. Jesus Christ is Lord. And the bottom line is Jesus is already the Lord. When he speaks of him as the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Lord. He doesn't become the Lord. He is the Lord. And ultimately, all will acknowledge that he is Lord. I've heard people giving their testimonies, and they'll say, well, Jesus was my Savior, and then I made him my Lord. That's really not accurate. I understand the sentiment, but that's really not accurate. You see, when it comes to salvation, Jesus Christ is the potential Savior of all mankind, the actual Savior of those who received him. Meaning that before I got saved, he was my potential Savior. He could save me, but I hadn't received salvation. But when I received Christ, now I see him and acknowledge him as my Savior. So potentially he was my Savior. When I got saved, actually he became my Savior. But the fact is he's a Savior of all who come to him but some refuse to do so. And because they refuse to come to him, they remain unsaved. On the other hand, he's Lord of all, regardless of whether uh, all come to him. He may be the potential savior of all, but he is the Lord of both believer as well as the unbeliever. He is the Lord, regardless if somebody regards him that way, regardless if somebody says, you are my Lord and I bow my knee to you. No, he's the Lord whether they will willingly do it uh, or like we do or ultimately do it. In the book of Philippians, in chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, Paul said it like this. He said, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So I do that now. I do it willingly now. Jesus, you are my Lord. But every knee will bow, even those who obstinately refuse to do so. All, all will bow before him. All who have ever lived will stand before him and then kneel before him and say, he is the Lord. That includes Buddha. That includes Muhammad. That includes Freud. That includes everybody. We do it right now willingly. We say, Jesus Christ, you are Lord. And with praise in our heart, I acknowledge his lordship. But every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is our Lord. And so he begins to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So I want you to notice this. Look at verse 3. He says, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting Paul begins by speaking of an obligation he has bound, an obligation he has to give thanks for them. Now, 
What has prompted this duty, this obligation to thank God on their behalf? Under fire, instead of wilting, they have remained steadfast, and that blesses him. You see, some professing Christians don't handle affliction well. They'll abandon their confession. They, they, they enter into a hard time, a hard season. Maybe people on the job side are rejecting them. Maybe their family turned their back on them. Maybe uh, people that were very close to them have no longer want to hang around with them. Now, the society we live in right now is, is very adamantly opposed to the Christian faith when it's well known, when, when the Christian faith is not compromised and they hear what we actually believe. The society that we're living in right now gets adamantly angry about it. I saw this just, just this weekend. At a, a, a preacher's preaching at the, uh, the funeral service for Aretha Franklin. And, and he says some pretty cutting things, pretty direct things. Perhaps some of you might have seen it was on the news. And I watched part of it. And I have to tell you, what he said was very strong. But as a Christian, I, I, I told my wife, I said, this man's very courageous. He's a very courageous man. He's telling the truth. What he's saying is accurate and it's right. But boy, everybody is angry at him, calling him names and everything. But he was preaching the truth. So we live in a society right now that people don't walk up and pat you on the back for believing what you believe. You know that, don't you? They don't walk up and say, thank you for telling me I'm a sinner. I really appreciate that. They don't do that. <laughs> they don't. They get angry and all of that. And so what happens is, is you can come under fire. Our faith comes under fire. And some professing Christians don't handle affliction well. And they'll abandon. They'll just say, I, I give up. I don't need this. Now, Jesus spoke of this in one of his parables, uh, the parable of the, the sower, uh, the seed, and the soils. In Matthew 13, in verses 20 and 21, Jesus said, He who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So as long as things are going cool and people like us, we're on the Jesus bandwagon. When I got saved back in 1970, and there was a uh, Jesus movement, hippie revolution, uh, people like myself, many were, were coming to professing faith in Christ. And, and I'm telling you, you know, at one time, the, the press, the Time magazine had had, had had a question back, I think it was around 1966, they had a question, is God dead? And then a few years later, they had a picture of Jesus on the magazine, same magazine, and, and it speaks of the Jesus movement, the Jesus revolution. And, and we were living in such odd times and all that many people were, were abandoning the faith, but God began to do a, a work. And, and a lot of hippies were professing faith in Christ. And I was one of those who came to faith in Christ during that movement of the Spirit. And so there were a lot of people that, that were joining the, the bandwagon. There were, there were musicians. You, you would see guys who were putting out songs about God and Christ and, and, and you know, odd songs that didn't even make any sense, like, like Norman Greenbaum's Spirit in the Sky and Garbage Songs, you know, that I thought, man, that's stupid. You know, but what you ended up with, with all kinds of people, they were starting to sing gospel. You'd have gospel songs. They started to have Jesus Christ Superstar as a play. They had God's Spell. They were playing these songs on the radio, and, and, and well-known people were beginning to, to say things about Jesus. John Lennon, so, Lennon so you may remember John Lennon from the Beatles, at one point was walking around in his apartment, and it was recorded how he was saying, praise the Lord, praise Jesus Christ, and yet he's later on writing Imagine. And so there was this movement that was going that, that a lot of people were on. It was like a, a giant wave in many ways. And, and a lot of people were standing up saying, yes, uh, I, I believe in Jesus. And so the day I got saved, I, I was in a Volkswagen van. It was filled. So there must have been eight to nine people in that van. In that van. And we, that van, and we went to, to the Maranatha concert and I uh, heard the gospel. I got saved. And uh, then one by one, of those eight or nine that were in that van, those other eight, one by one they fell away, one by one, because the Jesus movement seemed to die off. It was no longer cool to call yourself Christian, to walk around with your Bible, to wear this huge tuna around your, your neck, a fish that is as big as your chest, to call it the tuna. 
And they carried family Bibles around with them. And it's not cool anymore. They're not making songs about Jesus anymore. They're not having specials on TV about Jesus anymore. They're not putting out God's bell and they're not putting out Jesus Christ Superstar anymore. And uh, these rock legends who were claiming faith in Christ are all fading away slowly but surely and affliction begins to rise up. And before you know it, those who are running around saying, I believe in Jesus are denying that they ever knew him. And that did happen. Well, Paul's endurance, or rather their endurance, gave Paul considerable joy. It prompted his praise to God. And what is it that he thanks God for on their behalf? Basically, he thanks God for three things, for faith, love, and patience. So notice how he says in verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. So the first thing he thanks God for, I'm bound to say thank you to God for, is your faith grows exceedingly. Your faith is outgrowing all boundaries. Now in Paul's first letter, he had mentioned a concern he had about their faith in Jesus. It wasn't that they didn't have faith, but it was something he desired improvement on. And he made this clear in his first epistle. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, he had said, Night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. So Paul rejoiced in the fact that the persecution actually was re refining their faith. In 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, Peter said, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. So in spite of opposition, their faith is growing tremendously, and this blessed him. You see, so many simply give up in the face of opposition, but they grew stronger. They actually were living out their faith, and as a result, they were growing spiritually and maturing. So one... I thank God for your faith. It's growing. Second, I'm obligated to thank God for your love because your love abounds to one another. The hostility that they were enduring drew them closer. Instead of abandoning relationships, they increasingly depended upon one another. When one of them suffered, they all suffered along with the one who was hurting. They listened to them. They prayed for them. They spiritually and emotionally supported them. The church was banding closer because God's love was drawing them. And through the affliction, they supported one another. I was in India. I spent uh, 16 days in India. I've been there twice. I've spent a month in India. And this one trip that uh, I, I joined in a group of pastors to go on, we went from, from, from uh, one portion of India to the next. We went all around the country. And we were in a particular church, and uh, it was a house. And it was a small home, but it was packed with believers. And there's no fans or anything. They had one fan, and they had it in the front. And that's about it. And at that time... The house itself probably was, without exaggeration, anywhere from 110, 215, 120 degrees. That's how hot it was inside that house. We were all seated on the ground. And the men were seated on one side. The women are seated on the other. And as we were there, the service goes for three to four hours. So as we were seated there in 110 to 120 degrees, they're doing their worship, they're doing various things. And then at one point, they had testimony time. And I'll never forget how that people would stand up and give what God has done in their life. And it was testimony time by those who had been persecuted that week. And I'll always remember a woman who stood up with a black eye. Her eye was swollen, mostly shut. And she stood up and she began to share how that her husband, who is not a believer was angry at her for being a Christian and had beaten her up just a couple days before. And she stood up 
to give her testimony. And as she's giving her testimony, you can see the people there as they're giving her encouragement and saying things to her. I can't help but think of that church when I think of these people here. Paul is saying, your faith has grown. It's been refined. It's growing and abounding. But your love for one another has grown also. So in the midst of the persecution and affliction that you're going through, you'll hear each other. You'll pray for one another. You'll love one another. And you encourage one another. And in doing so, you're going to strengthen each other the way that you ought to be stronger because of what this church is willing to do. You see, love for one another is the true mark of a Christian, not simply the things that we're opposed to. And I think that today, the church in many places is, is really more known for what we stand against, and I think we need to. I think we need to say this is what God says. We need to stand firm in those things. There's no doubt about it. But it seems to me that sometimes we, we are, are getting caught up with wanting everybody to know what we don't like, and not everybody knows what we're in favor of. A lot of people know what we don't like. We got mad that somebody told us not to eat In-N-Out burgers. That just happened this week. Some of you are aware of that. A boycott against In-N-Out burgers. And, and then Christians showed those people something by standing in line to get a burger. <laughs> and I know it made them shake in their boots. Hungry Christians. I, 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 I um... I saw pictures of uh, people standing in line for In-N-Out. And by the way, I like In-N-Out. I eat it all the time. I think it's the best burger you're going to get, okay? <laughs> it's a great burger, animal style. Yeah, it's good, huh? Mm-mm-mm. <laughs> so I do it. I, I like it. But I also think that human beings are funny. Because I see lines of people to go get a burger... I wish I saw lines of people waiting to get to church. I would like to see that. I would like to see lines of people saying, let's get the word of God. I mean, let's face it. I mean, eat the burger, don't eat the burger. I will. I'll do it on your behalf if you won't. I mean, I'm good with it. But I think that, that, that what are we saying? What are we saying? You know, you can't tell me to eat a burger. There are so many things going on in this world that we're quiet about. But when you tell me not to eat something, that's when I get mad. So the world knows that we are opposed to things. Maybe the world needs to also know what we're in favor of. Listen, when a pastor stands up and tells you what to be afraid of all the time, it takes your joy from you, and it makes you angry. This property that we're on right now, we've been here since 92. This property was sold to us by a church that was pastored by a man who sowed fear into the heart of the congregation. He sowed fear into the heart of the congregation. When he sold us this property, he got up and took as many of the church who were willing to go with him to another state. And he actually, they got some left their houses without being paid for. They just got up and left their houses and they moved to another state. And when we took possession, we went into the different areas and we we're going through cleaning and all. And we found a box of tapes from his church services. And during the church services, they would have testimony time. And one of the testimony times that we listened to were the voices, we heard the voices of older people, older ladies, who were saying things like, I was asleep this morning in my neighborhood. I heard... I heard in my neighborhood, I was asleep in a house, and I heard someone trying to open the door, and I looked out, and I saw a Mexican guy standing out there. We need to get out of here. And then another one says, I heard this, another one says, we were in, I was in the Montclair Mall, and I saw gangsters walking by, and we're in danger. We need to get out of here. Now listen, if you're afraid of gangsters, pray for them. Pray for them. I know too many gangsters who got right with Jesus Christ. God is a God who saves anybody who's willing to come to him. Pray for him. What are you so afraid of? Pray for him. I, last week, I was given a, a, a Sunday morning, and a brother stopped me and was sharing with me. I can't give you his whole testimony, but I will tell you this. I was so blessed to hear, and I'm going to have him share. I, I hope if you're here right now, I'm going to have you share at the MGM. 
But he was telling me how that he had basically grown, many of his years of his life were, were here. And then he had strayed. And as he had strayed, he was, you know, starting to think, I've got to get right with God. I've got to get right with God. And he's saying that, I have, Lord, I have to get right with you. I know, I know, I have to get right with you. And he said, I was at a mall. And somebody walks up to me and taps me on the shoulder. And I turn and I look at this person. I've never seen him in my life, he told me. I've never seen him. He taps me on the shoulder. And the guy says, I'm sorry, but I'm a Christian. And the Holy Spirit just told me to tell you something. The Holy Spirit just told me to tell you you need to come back to God. You need to get right with him. And then the guy takes off. And he's going, whoa. He says, wow, that's interesting. I've been praying. God, I know I need to get right with you. And this stranger, wow. And he says, I did nothing. Then a, a short time later, he was somewhere else. And somebody, another stranger, he says, I feel a tap. And I turn. I said, yeah. And the guy says, I'm sorry. I'm a Christian. And the Lord just told me to tell you, you need to get right with him. And he goes, oh, you know, that's interesting. You know, hmm. He says, a couple weeks later, I'm in a, another mall. His wife drags him to mall for punishment, I guess. And <laughs> he, goes, he goes, I'm in another mall. And a guy walks up to me a third time, another stranger, and says, the Lord has placed it on my heart. You need to get right with him. You need to come back to him. He said it was God constantly sending people to speak to me that I knew I needed to get right. He serves here. He goes to the Sentinella prisons to, to prison to, to minister to those in, in chains right now. God can reach anybody. And don't forget that. And God will move and he will change hearts. And, and the Lord has a tendency of doing that. And we need to be careful that we remember that, that God uh, has given to us the love of the Spirit and, and the, the love of God is a mark of a believer. The visible identifier of a believer is Christ-like love. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, Paul writes and defines love for us he says, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. And that's the testimony. That's the testimony. That's what Christians are. And it's even a testimony that, that non-believers can say of Christians. Uh, Tertullian, a writer that lived uh, 150 to 225 years before Christ, wrote that the Christians' deeds of love were so noble that the pagan world confessed in astonishment, see how they love one another. So this kind of love makes an impact on people living in a loveless world. And knowing how important love is, Paul prayed that they would grow in love. In 1 Thessalonians, he had said in chapter 3, verse 12, may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. In chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verses 9 and 10, he said, concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do so toward all the brethren in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. So the times of pressure they were enduring produced the fruit of love. They went through pain, they went through persecution, but they learned to care deeply for one another. And then third, they were exhibiting great patience in the face of persecution. He says, and notice this in verse 4, we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So we boast of you among the churches of God. When I'm speaking to somebody, I will say, you know, God is moving in the church of Thessalonica. When I'm preaching a message from a pulpit, I'll say, and God is moving in the church there 
in Thessalonica. He says, I boast of you among the churches of God, and I boast of you for your patience and faith and all your persecution and tribulation that you endure. So that reveals what actually should matter to a minister of the gospel. Paul glories in their patience and faith because they endured persecution and affliction. In spite of the opposition and affliction they endure, they remain strong in the Lord. And that comforted Paul's heart because he was concerned for their spiritual state. He, it, he, he wasn't bragging about the numbers of people who showed up. He wasn't bragging about the, the uh, amount of influence that, that, that they were exerting in, in some worldly way. He said, the thing that, that charges up my heart, the thing that, that causes me joy, the thing that makes me pray, a, a prayer of gratitude, is the fact that, that, that you are patient in your faith and God is moving. You have not forgotten who you are. I, I glory in your patience. I glory in your faith. You have endured persecution. You have held up under affliction. And I am blessed. Now, he had already written to them in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 5, and he had said, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, our labor might be in vain. In the face of rejection and affliction and persecution, they exhibited great patience. Now, in the New Testament, patience does not speak of meek submissiveness. Oh, well, what can I do? Patience speaks of heroic endurance, in the face of great trouble and pain. This was a church that was a victim of people who were organizing concentrated persecution against them. But in spite of that, they courageously and heroically were holding fast to what they were taught. And that's because their faith is grounded in God and they had hope in Him. In Psalm 146, verse 5, happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Psalm 56, verse 3, whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. So Paul was blessed. These relatively new believers were standing strong. And under trials or persecutions, it is possible for believers to momentarily lose those qualities, but this had not happened to them. And Paul rejoices. And the reason he can is because their faith is growing. Their love is abounding because they are deeply rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. Jesus, the true vine, said in John 15, verse 5, without me, you can do nothing. And that's the foundation of our Christian faith. To be a Christian speaks of being attached to Jesus. He is the source of our life, and the love of the Lord is the evidence of salvation, and Jesus is the center of all attention. And love sets you free to be faithful to the one you love. It's the core of our service to God. So he rejoices because their faith and love is demonstrated by their patience. His concern has been soothed by their continuation. Faith, love, and patience is exhibited in the face of prolonged and aggressive hate towards them. And his heart is overcome with relief and gratitude. And he uses them as examples. I want you to know something. I want you to know that as he says, we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith. I want you to know from my heart to yours that I boast about you. Just so that you know, I boast about you. I talk about you when I go to other churches and I say, they're stinkers. No, I say, <laughs> I say how much I love you. And I think that love should not be said just to others and not the person who's loved. I think that a lot of men will say, yeah, I love my wife, but they say it to their friends. But they need to also say it to their wife, right? Honey, I love you. And I think there are women who say, yeah, I love my husband, but they never say, baby, I love you. So what's nice when you say, I love you, or I love somebody to others, but I think I owe it to you to tell you from my heart to yours. I love you. I love this church. And I boast about you. God has blessed us with you. We, we had a woman's thing the other day, 350 hamburger hungry women. <laughs> you know, there were 350 who bought hamburgers, but closer to 500 who attended the study. And, and I'm blessed by that because... Because there are people who are busy serving 
Then there are, those, there are those who are there arriving and they're cared for. But do you realize how many people are serving you when you come to church? I do. That we have hundreds of people involved in our children's ministry. We have people in this church who took their vacation during VBS, their week's vacation, when they could be somewhere else at, at the river or at a beach or just staying at home. But they're here every day in 100 plus weather caring for our children. And hundreds and hundreds of kids are coming and many are hearing the gospel claims. We have somebody who drives over an hour plus to get here, to serve here and does it faithfully. And I love you for that. I thank God for you and your service to Jesus Christ. For those who are out in that parking lot when it's raining and they're saying, could you please park here? For those who are standing there when it's 110 degrees and they're sweating and they're saying, could you stand here? For the ushers who stand and help you, for the people who are in the cafe, for the people who are on the, and our worship team, we have one paid employee on our worship team and the worship groups that we have are all volunteered. And I thank God for your service to Jesus Christ. I thank God for that. I do. And, I, and I'm controlling my emotions because they're that deep. I love you. I love you so much. And I boast about you. You guys don't know, but I do. I'll say I love my church. I've got some loving people in this church. And I run across you sometimes different places, and you'll walk up and you'll say, hi, pastor, I just want to say hi. I don't want to take your time. I say this every time I mention this, you don't take my time. I give you my time. It's worth me giving you my time. You are my family. I love you, and I boast about you before the Lord, and I'm telling you personally how deeply I'm committed to you. The way Paul said, I love you Thessalonians. I boast about you. You need to know I boast about you too. Thank you for your service to Jesus Christ. Thank you. You are an example, he was saying, of what a fellowship should be. In the face of persecution, in the face of organized opposition, you have remained faithful. You have become a great example to others. You have been thoroughly convinced of the truth of the gospel. And no persecution, no trial of faith has turned you aside from it. In the Gospel of John, in chapter, chapter 6, verses 66 through 69, we have in that portion of Scripture a question that I believe is asked of every believer sometime in their life, maybe more than once. And in John 6, verse 66 through 69, it says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe that through affliction, through tough times, you are someday going to hear, if you haven't already heard it, that question, do you also want to go away? Jesus had been speaking. He had just fed the 5,000. And these people had come and pursued him. They followed to him to where he had gone. And, 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 and he says, you're following me because I fed you. And, and, and you ate some bread and you, and you ate some fish. And, and you're following me for that reason. But the bread and the fish isn't enough. You have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood or you have no life in you. And when he said that, they said, this is a difficult saying. Who can understand it? And from that moment on, they turned and they began to walk away. And all of these people that you would see, crowds of people that had walked up to follow Follow Jesus, and he sees a crowd, and he makes that statement. Now picture them as they turn, and they walk away from him. And you can see them as their white robes are disappearing out of sight. And he turns to his disciples, do you guys want to go away too? Do you? You will hear that question. You will hear that question. Some of you have. Some of you have heard it more than once. I have heard it. I have heard it. I have heard the Lord speak to my heart saying, do you want to go away? And I have, I have been there in that place where I'm thinking, and I've answered, Lord, to whom shall I go? You have the words of eternal life. There is nothing else for me. There is no other life for me. There are no other friends for me. There are no other relationships for me. There is nothing left for me except for you, Lord. No, I don't want to go away. 
persecution, affliction, tough times, sorrow of heart, anxiety, concern. There'll be a voice you will hear, one form or another. Are you ready to give up? Do you want to turn around? Do you want to go back? No, Lord. No. Lord, I gave everything up. You said, pick up my cross and follow you. And I have. Has it been easy? No. No. It hasn't been. Have there been times when I've said, there's got to be something else to do? Yes, many times. But at the end of the day, to whom shall we go? To whom? Who's been better to you than him? Who has loved you deeper than Jesus? Who has gone as far on your behalf as he? Who wept for you in a garden? Who allowed thorns to be pressed onto his brow? Who allowed himself to have nails piercing his hands and feet? It was Jesus. And you say, do you love me? And he stretches out his hands and he says, I love you this much. And he dies. Three days later, he rises from the dead. And he says, what seems to be dead, remember, there's life in me. There's life in me. And I give you my life because I've given you my love. And I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. And I am preparing a place for you. And I will call you to be with me for where I am. There you shall be also. So you have hope. Hold fast to the Lord and watch God. See the salvation of the Lord. And he will cause you to rejoice in the end. And that's why Paul could say, Jesus Christ. And I thank God for you. That's how it works. You could have turned away, but you didn't. Your faith, your love, and your patience has increased. And for this, I thank God. And I brag about you because of what God has done in you. May he do the same work in us.